Hey everybody! My name is Neil Brennan. I got a Netflix special called Blocks, uh, where I go over the things in my life that make me feel like something's wrong with me, it's that I'm crazy, that I'm isolated, that I'm alone in the world. And uh, my friend Jimmy Carr had the idea to have my friends come on and tell me what their blocks are. And we uh, we get vulnerable and we shame shame. One of my old good buddies is here. Uh, a mental health crusader hey. like myself. A couple of goddamn crusaders. Charlemagne the God is Neil here, Neil Brennan. What's happening, um, my brother? I I'm, love blocks, by the way. Thank you. Thank I mean, you, sir. You don't get enough credit for your stand-up specials, man. Thank Three you. mics and blocks are two of the most uh, interesting and, and different devices used to get into stand-up comedy. You, you heard know? the man. You fucking heard I'm the man. I'm surprised people didn't steal the Three Mics concept. I worked with um, Ellen DeGeneres on her last special, and at one point, Portia, her wife, was like, I just wish she could do three mics. Why can't she? I mean, I was going to do a series yeah. of letting other people do it, but then Netflix started giving people 20 million bucks. Oh, got you. Got <laughs> so, you. like, it was like, all right, well, I'm not going to, I'm not, I, no one's going to do it for, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, Dave or Tre anybody who's getting Chris, any of like the, tight, the $20 million club ain't going to do. Yeah. They're not going to give me 15 minutes of stand up. Yeah, and it's you know? like it's interesting you turned blocks into this because nobody could do blocks but you. Like once that concept is done, yes. it's done as far as stand up. Yes. But for this it makes sense the podcast yes. format. Yes. Thank you. So anyway, one of the th things that I I'm most flattered by with you and I don't even remember saying this. You said you're I would say you're like the uh, a leader in uh black mental health, right? Absolutely. And you said I you went to therapy because I went to therapy. Absolutely, I always credit you because you you were one of the people that were always talking about it. And whether I whether you knew I was curious about it or whether you knew I was going through you know dealing with anxiety and bouts of depression, hearing you talk about how it helped you made me be like, man, I really need to go. go that seek means it out. more to me than I can ever express because oh. you don't know. And I remember posting it on Instagram like, uh, and like Kevin Love and like like. That people don't talk about it mm -hmm. and it's not it's just not that big a deal to me that's the thing like i i think because i was the youngest in my family i got to test out like hey i go to therapy and i take medication on older people yeah. and then be like how long are you gonna do that and just all the sort of judgment yeah. and then once i was once i sort of like stood my ground with them I have no shame about yeah, you talking about it so nonchalantly. Pete Davidson talking about it so nonchalantly. Amanda Seals, you know, uh, the, the, those are the people that I, I'm, I'm around. I'm talking to. Right. So just hearing y'all talking about it so nonchalantly was like, yeah, man, I need to really go try to figure this out because I'm hearing y'all talk about things that I deal with. Yeah, you know, I'm hearing y'all use language to identify these experiences that I've had my whole life. Well, that's my question. When did you become aware of it? Because because you were living just like a not a, you were never like a knucklehead knucklehead right? Where I mean you were just like uh, living no, a I regular was. life. Oh, I was kind of a, I was. It depends what you call knuckleheadish. You know what I mean? But yeah. my whole life, I I've always dealt with panic attacks. I just never knew what they were. I actually thought I was just pussy. You know what I'm saying? Because literally, I'd be walking down like my dirt <laughs> road and see a car coming and go shoot off in the woods and hide and don't know why. I don't know why, you know, my heart starts racing the way it does. Don't, don't know why my palms start sweating. And you had no idea what was happening? No. You just thought you were a pussy? I thought oh. I was a pussy. And then you yeah. think about it, growing up in the 90s, we grew up in the era where you had to be hardcore. Right. Like there was actual, uh, it was a genre yes. <laughs> of music Doesn't called hardcore. Puffy descri or Biggie or Puffy <laughs> describes a panic attack in one of those songs? Oh, a lot of them. I mean, yeah, but like, su it, suicidal thoughts. Biggie yeah, had a yeah, song called exactly. Suicidal Thoughts. Was Suicidal Thoughts like, like when dudes heard it, were they like, this is pussy ass shit or were they like okay Not, you, i don't you know i don't know what i thought when i heard suicidal thoughts i honestly thought that it was just like a watching a movie almost like you know how you watch a yeah, horror yeah, yeah, movie yeah. and like it's supposed to feel this way yeah i just thought he was you know pinning out words like he had another song called i don't want to live no more sometimes yeah. i hit death knocking at my front door growing up in a certain environment you feel like that all the time anyway you know what i mean and and i i don't i don't think i've ever felt like i wanted to die like yes. even when they say the song even when this, the album's called Ready to Die, yeah. 
probably because of the lifestyle we were living at the time, we felt like it could happen at any moment, yeah. but we weren't, I wasn't speaking that into existence. You know right. what I mean? Oh, I didn't yeah. want it to happen. Do you feel like it was a com? it was like a more common thing? Like the ready to die thing is obviously like a stance mm -hmm. born out of like, uh, living in a shitty environment and Absolutely. you have to pretend like i don't even give a fuck and do all that shit absolutely and do you feel like most dudes are experiencing some form of mental health not whether it's a crisis or not just like yes there is and is it how much better do you think it gets a year well it, it in the, let's just take black males it doesn't get better if you don't do it do the work but i'm saying culturally like how much more accepted is it getting Oh, oh no, no! It's it's it's, it's more accepting than it's ever been. You know, yeah. I, mean, I think about when I wrote my second book, Shook One, and it came out in 2018. And then my, I remember Thanksgiving of that year, my father called me. I was home in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, and I had a cousin who had committed completed suicide that week. And that was like the fourth time that he attempted it. But you know, he completed it. My father called me, and between my book and that moment, he told me he was like, "Man, I've been going to therapy, you know, two and three times." A week, you know, I, I I was on ten to twelve different medications throughout my life. I tried to commit suicide when I was like thirty years old. So he and, and, and I'm listening to him tell me these things. And I remember calling my mom like, "Yo, mom, did you know pops was going through all this?" And she was like, "Yo, I thought he was playing crazy to get a check, because that's what happened back then when you would try to go deal with your issues and they couldn't figure out." What the issue problem is, they're gonna put you on medication and they're gonna start and giving you, get, you a and check. And you get disability. Absolutely. So it's like if I would have known he was going through that back then, I would have known what I was dealing with when I was younger. Because he dealt with all the same things. I so it was a similar portfolio of issues. My father used to sleep with a knife and a gun by his bed because he said the devil was I mean, coming who to get do him that? at night. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> he said the devil was coming to get him at night. You know what I mean? Like there was Wait, always- so, so no taser as well? I go, oh, with I go gun, taser. knife, and taser. Oh, he, he snuck a taser in the MetLife Stadium. Oh, that's yeah, so well, he didn't sneak it in. He's from South Carolina, so he's used to having it on him. That's what my dad always said, keep something on you. So he literally just walked into MetLife Stadium on 9-11. I think this was like 2011, 2012. And he walked in during the Cowboys-Jets game and got into a fight with a Marine on 9-11. <laughs> and, and ended up tasing him. True story, Google it. What were they? Were they arguing about football? My dad, uh, he, you know, he's older. He's not old, old, but he's older. And so it was the Pledge of Allegiance. And he, weren't, he wasn't standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, not because he was trying to disrespect the flag. He just he couldn't stand up for that period of time. So he's sitting down at the game. And uh, when, my, when his wife tried to get up to go to the bathroom, the mirror was like, no, because y'all didn't stand up for the pledge. And my dad was like, man, get the fuck out the way. And the Marine was like, no. So my dad just hit him with the tape. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So... What was, when do you remember first having issues in the, any kind of mental health issue? For, oh, pan, my first panic attack, now that I know what a panic attack is, was first grade. It was first grade. Wow. My mother dropped me off at Memager Elementary School because uh, I'm born in Charleston, but raised in Monk's Corner. But my mom used to teach at Courtney Middle School in downtown Charleston. So we would drive from Monk's Corner. I, I think we might've been staying, no, we were staying in like a trailer park in Charleston. And I can't remember the name of it, but we used to drive from the trailer park to the school and just her dropping me off in first grade. I remember having a panic attack in first grade and crying uncontrollably to the point that my mom didn't want to leave, but she had to go to the school and like all of the teachers trying to console me. I'm in first grade bawling, like just having a severe panic attack. You and know, heart racing. Heart and racing, palm sweating, everything shaking, like, you know, like really thinking something is wrong with me. And 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 it and, and when I it wasn't because my mom was dropping me off. My mom had been dropping. My mom dropped me off the kindergarten when I was young. I can remember. Oh, so that. you'd already been to school. This was not even your no, first day. Of first school. grade. Right. It was Memorial Elementary School. First grade. So I, year two of school. Yeah, I remember Little Red Riding Hood. You know the school that I used to go to and the kindergarten I used to go to at the preschool. I remember that. I didn't have those panic attacks then, but that first day of first grade, severe panic attack. I. You know what's interesting? My first day of kindergarten. So it was my first day of school. Mm -hmm. She. They dropped me off in the morning. This is a, a couple things here. And I bawled uncontrollably. Wow. That was the first time I realized I was clinically depressed. But then it turns out I wasn't supposed to be in the morning session. I, I was signed up for the afternoon session. And then so they, like, I got booted and then they brought me back for the afternoon. And wow. I didn't cry in the afternoon. There's a few metaphors. So there, you're not a morning is, person. Not a morning person. <laughs> first metaphor. Um, 
have to practice things once to be good at it. Mm. Have to like do a rehearsal. And uh, when you're one of 10 kids, your parents forget shit. <laughs> um, I got a theory for that, though. Like our, our generation of parents were too busy trying to survive. You know what this I mean? This is what I talked to Roy about. <laughs> Roy Woods Jr. was here last night. And like there's a level of arrogance in our generation to like think, well, where, what happened there? It's like, motherfucker, first of all, I had problems. And then the generation before me, it's like you go back one or two generations and they're all illiterate, That's right. first of all. That's right. And uh, the all my people were illiterate farming people. So like I'm, who am I laying these expectations at? Yeah. You know what I mean? We're, like, we're the first generation to have the luxury of healing. Yes. And actually changing things we don't like. Yeah. That shit is a luxury to be able to go get your teeth. Absolutely. <laughs> and I don't even say it's a luxury. It's like, a, I don't like getting into like the, you know, the privilege of our, it's like, I just feel like it turns people off in mm -hmm. terms of makes you feel bad about a thing that like we should all be entitled to. Right. But you're absolutely right in that the hierarchy of needs in terms of just like food, shelter, right. clothing. And then we just, a lot of our families just solved this like in the 90s. That's right. No, you're right. <laughs> like yeah, out of the, uh, the muck, so to speak. Absolutely. So, so yeah, but I'm, I'm happy that your, uh, I, it's just I the I like really genuinely admire like the fact that you don't have any shame either about it or maybe you do or and you've gotten over it. But. When I wrote Shook One, that came out of a uh, my book agent pressing me to do a second book. I didn't want to do a second book. First one was Black Privilege. The right? First one was Black Privilege. You know, I I put my my life up to that point into the book. So when they come to me about a second book, I'm like, what the fuck would I write about? Like, you know what yeah. I mean? And then uh, and also at that point, I was the most confused I had ever been because let me see, that was twenty. 18, 20, late 2017, early 2018. So I had started going to therapy in 2016. So you already know, when you first start going to therapy, that is the most confusing yeah. time of your life because you're unlearning so much shit. Yeah. And everything you thought you knew, you realize I know nothing. Yeah. So I'm like empty when she's asking me this, but I was keeping a journal of everything that I was learning in uh, therapy. And I was like, man, I got this this journal of things that I was learning about myself in therapy. I said, like, maybe we could, you know, put that out. But what I realized when I started writing the book was the things I was learning in therapy was for me to understand. I couldn't explain it to people, you know? So what we ended up doing was I just put my experiences that I was going to therapy for in the book and I bought in an actual psychiatrist. What couldn't you explain to people? I couldn't explain, like, why certain traumas impacted me the way that they did. I, I, I can now, I couldn't then. Give me an example. Oh man, um, this is gonna sound crazy. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find one of the lighter ones. But, no, you don't have to. Yeah, but. <laughs> then you've come to the right place if you want. Yeah, just something as simple as like, putting out a first book, having extreme success with that book, but still dealing with depression and panic attacks. And even though I've in had, light, it, despite the fact that despite the fact, more money, more exactly. visibility, and, and, more and, and even though we've done book signings and they were insane, still being in LA, trying marijuana for the first time, not for the first time, but for the first time in a long time, which was a bad idea, yeah. trying to get rid of the anxiety, right? Not realizing sativa makes your anxiety going through the roof. And this new weed is something totally different. So now I'm in my head like, look at this stupid motherfucker about the overdose in LA off marijuana. You know what I mean? When he's having, when he's at kind of like at the height of some of his success. Typical new, new stardom shit. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So that's driving me crazy. And then like me and my wife in the room, and I'm just all, telling myself all of these different things. Like, there's no way this woman could have liked me all of these years. And you know, like she, we've been, we've been, we'll be together 25 years this year. But in that moment, I'm like, there's no way she likes me. I'm like, you know what? She, she, she wanted me to smoke weed because she wants me to die. We just got a life insurance policy. Like, I, like all of that stupid shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I, I can't explain that to people. I can't explain like. Which part couldn't you explain? The, the success part or yeah. the. I think it's, it's easier for me to explain now. Um, I couldn't explain it back then because I was, I was still dealing with imposter syndrome as well. Right. So even saying I'm successful 
that voice. Well, let's like, put a, let's you? do a block on imposter syndrome. Yeah. All right. Tell me about your imposter syndrome. My experience of you, it's you earned. You didn't get any breaks that I'm aware of. I didn't skip any steps. Yeah. Yeah. So why the imposter syndrome? Because I mean, you know, you you be around your heroes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you're handling it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, two specials change the game. But that's true though. Like you, like somebody like you, you know, y'all, you, you created the power show. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so it's like you never quite feel like you fit in until you have conversations with people like yourself, right, or other people that I admire, and they've never quite fit in either. You know what I mean? Well, that's the other thing is your like uh, appeal is if it were baseball, you're like a knuckleball thrower. Explain. I, I hate baseball. Uh, I used to love it better when everybody uh, was You're like, if there was a lineup of people, I wouldn't go. Yeah, like he'll be the most successful gotcha. black radio person. Gotcha. I just, just, I just be like, I don't know. Like maybe him. Gotcha. I'd be on. You're be on my list of ma- like because you're funny, but you don't lead with it. You're smart, but you don't lead with it. It's everything sneaky. You know what I mean? Gotcha. You're like, it's like everything's sort of off speed and kind of like, oh, by the way, like uh, I'm sure when you started getting a lot of hits on YouTube. I'm sure the radio station was like. I never paid it no attention. The crazy part is I never, I always knew that I, I always said I want to be one of the biggest radio personalities in the country. When I started in 1998, that was my mindset. I want to be the big, one of the biggest radio personalities in the country compared to the Howard Stearns, the Angie Martinez, the yeah. Wendy Williams, the people, you know, Tom Joyner, Doug yep. Banks, God bless the dead, like those individuals. So I, I knew I wanted to be in that realm. When we started Breakfast Club, I told NBA and Angela, we're going to be syndicated. Right, I knew that, but I've always been the type of person just to bury my head in the work. Like I don't pay attention to any of it. So when I do peek my head out and realize like what's going on, it's like, oh shit. Well, I'm okay. <laughs> how do you? Back. How can you kind of will something like that and have imposter syndrome? I just knew, but that doesn't mean. Be, no, Why I, did you think you would be? But, you, but, the chemistry or like? Well, no, but think of the difference, right? Knowing that you're going to be successful at something still doesn't mean you feel like you deserve to have it or you belong in that position you just know but sometimes you can get in those positions and be like i don't deserve none of this shit joe if these motherfuckers only knew you know what, what did mean? you see coming do you know what i mean like when you said we're gonna be syndicated tell me why you thought that i just knew i i knew the success i was having in radio you know i, I can't even call it success i got fired four times right think that's about what I'm that. saying. you know what i'm saying i had gotten fired four times yeah. but every time i got fired some I got I got I failed up like I got put in a better position. So yeah. on this fourth time I got fired from radio in Philadelphia doing mornings back home living with my mom. When I got the gig for Breakfast Club, I knew we were going to be successful because I had been watching Envy, you know, online with when he was at Hot 97 and Power 105 and on Shade 45. Same thing with Angela E. I was watching her on Shade 45. I had guest co- guest co-hosted on Angela E's Shade 45 show. So I just knew us three together, if we did what we always have done and we, we all were co-hosts, so I knew that would work. And if we utilized the internet the way that, you know, we all were individually, we would have some type of success. And I just was looking at the game. I'm like, yo, there's no, this lane is wide open. Yeah, like, well, that's, it was definitely wide yeah, open. Yeah, I'm like, if we're not, if, if it's not us that's going to end up being syndicated, then who? Yeah. You know, because at the time there was no You guys seem like younger shows. than everybody. Yeah, and and that, that too, that, that's very true. Because I mean, at the time, Tom Joyner was kind of making his transition, yeah. you know, and there there really was nothing, there, the lane was yeah. wide open. Yeah. It was just there for the taking. So I just knew if we did what we were supposed to do, we were going to have success. And so then it becomes- And being with iHeart, being that iHeart right. likes to syndicate shows. When you got fired, did you think like, yeah, I deserve that. You were right to fire me. Yeah. No, yeah. I never thought about it. It was just like, damn, again. Like, I thought that was the way. You know who used to say that shit? Donnell Rollins. Donnell, Donnell Rollins used to say, if you've been fired three times in radio, you're a star. He's kind of right, yeah. Yeah, so I, when it happened the first time, I didn't I didn't know of Donnell then. It happened yeah. the second time, I didn't know of Donnell then. When it happened the third time with Wendy, you know, I had started to know Donnell. And I remember him saying that because he was doing his radio thing. Yeah. And I remember saying, like, damn, well, when the stardom going to happen? So when I got fired the fourth time, I'm like, well, shit, I must it's be way Donnell, overdue. Donnell's only been fired twice. <laughs> I was like, man, I must be way, way overdue. And then I remember going to see him when we first started doing Breakfast Club. He was at Caroline's and he said that 
on stage. He he had a whole joke about when you've been fired three times from radio, you become a star. And he was like, man, when they fire you from radio, you know, you just gone. They go from Power 1051, Charlamagne the God, Angela Yee, DJ Envy, to Power 1051, DJ Envy, Angela Yee. And, and it's just be like it is, they just erase you. And that shit was funny. But yeah. he was right. Yeah. You know? So I, I forgot the question. Yeah, okay. Well, the, here's the here, I'll rephrase the question. What do you think your shortcomings are when you are? Oh, imposter when you are, syndrome. Yeah. Okay. Wait, yeah. What do you? I, I started realizing imposter syndrome after I started going to therapy, and then I started backtracking, and then that made me realize why I felt the way I felt in so many moments. You know what I mean? Like when people talk about uh, overcompensation. You know what I mean? I can go back and look at certain moments where I was acting a certain way, being a certain way, because I was overcompensating for my shortcomings and creating the whole character of a Charlemagne, you know, the God. The, the, creating that character was to deflect from Leonard. You know what I mean? Maybe if I'm Your over here- Your real name's Leonard McKelvey. That's yeah. right. So maybe if I'm over here being this big, boisterous, loud, I don't give a fuck personality that nobody will pay attention to. What's funny is you're not that big and boisterous and loud. Yeah, well, back then people would, might say okay. otherwise, you know All what right. I mean? But back then it, it's like, let me protect them from this person that inside of me is shrinking in, in the corner. Got it. You know what I mean? That's why you never, I didn't used to go nowhere. I never, I've historically never gone, gone anywhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? Back then we would, you know, go to the clubs and stuff, but shit, I used to have to get lick it up and high out of my mind. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> to show up Just in public Just to, to get over then. the anxiety of it? Absolutely. And so it's like, Take, take take that lifestyle, getting up, getting drunk, getting high, going out every night, then going right on the radio in the morning. So yeah. it's like all that wild shit, not blaming it all on that, but a lot of that wild shit was because we was really living that lifestyle. All of us were. Me and me and Angela, we was all drunk high out of our minds, coming on the air, saying whatever, doing whatever, you know, talking to people, however. Okay, how did you get over the the imposter syndrome? Oh man, now see, that's interesting. I thought, like I said, I started therapy in 2016. I don't think I got over imposter syndrome until December of 2019. How do you know the date so well? Because you know, when you when you start realizing, it's when you this is when you brought COVID 19 from China to America, <laughs> and you finally got over your when you, when you start when you start uh, being still and actually assessing your life and not running from your bullshit, like 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 not running from you know, well, for me, it was like issues with my father and how my issues with my father showed up in relationships with my wife. You know what I mean? Because I never had saw healthy relationships prior to that. Like every, like my father and my mother got a divorce. I got mad uncles and aunts who got divorces and it was all because of infidelity. And I remember, you know, when I confronted my pops about his infidelity when I was like 17, he literally looked me in my eyes and was like, you only got one girlfriend? He was like, he was like, when you get older, you gonna understand. Wait, how? <laughs> yeah, he was real. confused. Like, wait, like, so like, you just that's it? <laughs> so, but think about what that does to a kid. You yeah. like, so having one girlfriend is fucked up. Like, I'm yeah. not supposed to have one girl. So you spend your the rest of your existence trying to have a bunch of women to please him. You know what I mean? Like, 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 let him see me with different women to show him like, yeah, I ain't just out here with one woman. That ain't even what I'm what I'm about. You know what right. I mean? I really do like being with one woman. I've always historically liked being with, with one woman. So, you know, you get older and I got married in 2014 and I'm literally looking in the mirror. Cause I, like I said, I always tell people, I love my pops. I love him. He was a, a, a good man, yep. right? He pr protected, provided, but he led with discipline you know, instead of love. And I don't like the way he, you know, did my mom. You know what I mean? Can we stop on discipline real yeah. quick? Do you buy that uh, argument that black male sons, uh, black male kids need physical discipline because if they don't do it at home, white people do it in the world? No, 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 no kid needs physical discipline. Okay. Kids need love. Kids need affection. You know what I mean? Kids need en en encouragement. You know what I mean? Like, that's what my dad thought he was giving me when I was young, but he really wasn't. He was fucking killing my confidence. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I, I always tell a story about how when I was 16, you know, and I had just got my license and, you know, I'm driving behind him. I'm following him, right? And he's like, do what I do. He's like, do what I do. So I'm driving behind him. Picking up women, extra women. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm driving behind him. He runs the stop sign. I run the stop sign too. 
So then he pulls over. I pull over. He gets out, walks up to my, the car, and slaps the shit out of me. <laughs> you slap him back. No. Keep dude, going. Not, right? He slaps the do shit out of me. Do what I do. And he's like, wake up. You ain't see, you ain't, you ain't see that fucking stop sign? I'm like, you ran. the. You told me to do what you do, and you ran the stop sign. I'm 16. I just got my fucking license. So that's where I remember in therapy unpacking that. The first time I ever had a breakthrough in therapy and cried was when I was like, oh, shit. I'm mad at my pops, not just because of what how I felt like he did my mom. It's more so he used to discipline me for shit he never taught me. Yeah. Well, that's I find all of childhood a lot like that. Absolutely. Like, Especially back just then. Just weird rules like what? Why would they expect us to know? Yeah, like I'm I've never <laughs> been here. Yes. How would yes. you think? How could I possibly know yes. these fucking weird, arbitrary yes. and entirely manufactured new rules you came up with. I, I remember, and it, this happened recently, because it bought, you know how you be having those moments as, in adulthood, you like, oh shit. Like, I remember saying to my pops, because my pops had, as, as far as I know, two other kids outside of my, 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 his marriage with my mom. And um, I had just met one of them. And I think at the time, let me see, I'm 44 now, maybe she's 47, 48, I'm not sure. And I remember at the time, I'm, I guess I was nine, so she was 13. I was like, guess what, Dad? In four years, I'm going to be the same age as, you know, uh, uh, Tara's her name, right? And he was like, how the fuck you going to be the same age as her? She's going to be, she's going to go, she's going to age up four years. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, shit, you know, he's right. But I'm, a kid, I'm not even yeah, thinking about it. was like, hey, you know, numbers are new to me, yeah. <laughs> sir. <laughs> I'm, I'm new to this whole numbers and aging, and there's some systems yeah. here that are fucking foreign. And I might I might have been a little older than nine. I don't remember, but that recently happened with. Uh, Look at after twelve, you deserve any sort of physical discipline he no. would have given you for that. <laughs> but up till then, have at it. And that, that recently happened with my oldest daughter. I forgot who she was talking about, but she she said something similar. And I and I, I when she said it, I yo, it took me. And you me, had to fight the impulse and be like, you stupid motherfucker. Yo, it took me right back to that. Like literally, it took me back to that moment in childhood. That shit felt like back to the future. Like, all right, motherfucker, you get yeah. a chance to correct history. Yeah. What are you gonna do? And I was it was, you know, gentle parent to like, uh, do a little math, baby. Like that. You know what right. I mean? Like, you know? Yeah. And she's she's laughing, like, oh, you're right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and it was just, it was just that simple. And, and, let's, and, and let's call grandpa on speaker. But, but tell I him what a piece of shit he is. But I told her about my experience when that happened. I was like, yo, I did the same thing when I was like yeah. around your age. You know what I mean? I, she's 14, so this might have been like last year. I was like, I did the same exact thing. And I told her how, how my dad reacted as opposed to how I reacted. But there's still the idea that like your your dad just had his own experience on earth and was like unhealed. and oh, And then 100%. so he takes it out on you. And that's his experience and your experience is like, hey, and you, there's validity to both of your experience. You know what I mean? Like, he's wrong in this situation, but like, it's all understandable. I learned, I, that's another thing I learned in therapy. Give your parents grace. Yeah. Because my dad was doing the best thing he, the best he could with what he had. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier. We the first generation that had the luxury of healing. They were just yeah. trying to survive. He couldn't even tell anybody he was going to therapy back then. Think about yeah. that. Yeah. And if he did, nobody took him serious. Yeah. My mom and got my mom's a beautiful English teacher, Jehovah Witness, very super empath. She thought he was playing crazy to get a check. So yeah. Think about that. So it's like, yo, he he was doing the best he could. So I give him all the grace in the world. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex. Guys, shouldn't you always be at your best? 2023 is the year to maximize your performance in the bedroom, wherever you have sex. Listen up, bluechew.com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredient as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in a chewable tablet and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, anywhere, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Wink. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet wink package. 
All right. So look, do I ever uh, take a erectile pill? I could sit here and tell you that I don't, but I'm all about vulnerability. And you're damn right I have. Here's my feeling about it. Why not? You know what I mean? Nobody knows. So, I mean, you know. So you'll know when we finally have sex, listener, that occasionally I take a an erectile dysfunction pill. It's a, it's insurance, or as people in the South call it, insurance. Why not give myself a little help? Inexpensive, chewable, LFG. Let's fucking go. Blue Chew wants to help you have uh, better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Neil N E A L at checkout. Pay just five dollars shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code Neil to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Thank you, Blue Chew. New year, new you. Stay on track with Magic Spoon, cereal that tastes like your childhood faves, but with more protein and less sugar. They got a variety pack. They got four flavors, which are cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. This pack has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs. Only 140 calories a serving. Uh, It's high protein, has zero sugar, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free. Not vegan. Neil, aren't you vegan? Look, between you and me, I'm mostly vegan. Sometimes I'll, I'll eat a milk or a cheese. I don't ask a lot of questions, you know? On sweets days, Sundays, sometimes I will slide some magic spoon into the repertoire. My favorites are peanut butter and frosted. I'm glad they came on as a sponsor because I actually used the product. It's delicious and crunchy. Go to magicspoon.com slash Neil to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code NEAL at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of high-protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash NEAL and use the code NEAL to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Thank you, Magic Spoon. Okay, let's go to one of your blogs. Social media. Yeah. Tell me. Because you said, you would do, the question was, what causes you... What makes you feel like something's wrong with you or something you feel alone or media, crazy? media, which is why I disconnect, because these motherfuckers will literally get online and tell you something's wrong with you all the goddamn time. <laughs> like, it's, like, <laughs> dude, it's wild. It's unbelievable. There's nothing productive on social media. It's, it's like, nothing. I was thinking if you want to, when they go, why do celebrities get plastic surgery? Go to the comment section of any celebrity, just a photo. That's right. The amount of criticism they're in for is insane. So like, cause people told them to get plastic surgery. Do you know what I mean? That's like, right. I get why they're doing it because they're they have no power in their mm-hmm. life, and basically, if you have status in the world, your social media is one of those dunk tanks. That's right. Where they just get to throw balls and they they hit it, That's you right. fall into the water. So it's just as somebody who gets commented on, how have you? What's been your arc with it? I disconnected because I learned that you know, in order to if you want to really lead the orchestra, you got to turn your back, you know, to the crowd. And and I remember. When they were like calling me like the hip hop Howard Stern and all that shit like that, like reading those articles, seeing stuff like that about me on social media, or seeing all of this, seeing what people liked about you, right? Like what people liked about you may be the things that you don't like about yourself, because you know at the end of the day, I'm going home to a beautiful woman every day who don't like none of this shit that I'm doing. You know what I mean? But in my mind, I'm like, what, 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 oh, like what? All this shit, like talking crazy to women in interviews, being overly sexual. Like I, that was during the era of like, I'm reading Max Tucker and shit like that. You know what I right. mean? So all of that college frat boy, yeah. perverted, you know, yeah. humor is like the shit, right? So it's yeah. like, I'm doing that on the air. And then when people say, oh, you're the hip hop Howard Stern, like, 
we've all seen private parts. I've read private parts like, oh, this what they want? You know what I mean? Right. I'm going to give them more of this. Oh, J-Lo's coming here? When she leaves, I'm going to sniff her seat. I, can I tell everybody when she comes to the interview, I'm going to sniff her seat? Like stupid shit like yeah. that. You know? So it's like that reading those comments and people gassing you up, telling you yeah. this is what they like about you. Like that right there fueled a lot of, a lot of bullshit. You and you, so you don't even consider that like market research going like, I like that no, about it. No, no. Well, what's funny is that the thing people like about you isn't that. But I but I didn't yeah. realize that. So when somebody says you're the hip hop Howard Stern, my dumb ass didn't even stop to think, well, what, what parts of Howard? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because Howard's one of the most phenomenal interviewers. Right. Well, that's you both have the same arc, which that's is my like thing, you know what I mean? less that and more insight. Yeah. Or, or he would. And curiosity. Or he would speak out against things he didn't like you know what i mean yeah. it wasn't the the baloney ass toss shit that he was doing you know what i mean like that's the old shit but we you don't know that i didn't i never stopped to think about it i'm just like they like this wild shit i'm gonna keep giving them you know this wild shit and then you look in the mirror because you like i said you at home with your, your your the love of your life and, and did you think your wife was like just hating and you're trying to sink the ship that's, that's keeping us afloat and in, in my mind i wasn't hating in my mind i'm just like yo i gotta get this money Right. I got it. This is what's keeping the lights on. I don't want to get fired. I've been fired four times. Do you remember how that felt when we had to pack up and move back to South Carolina? Like, you know, with a two year old, you know, and now this two year old is older now. Like, I got to, this is what's paying the bills right yeah. now. You know what I mean? But then you realize, like, man, no, none of that shit matter because you are so unhappy. And did the social media, did you, was it hard to quit? When you say quit, what does that mean? It means you oh, have yeah, somebody. I, I haven't been on Twitter in four, four or five years now. So, so it went from, being fueled by Twitter to the more you grow in, 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 your, your, in this game, the more, the more my name grew, the more outlandish shit started to get, you know what I mean? The more attacks started to actually happen, you know what I mean? And sometimes you go online and you be like, who the fuck is this person that they talk about? Like, it, yeah. it, it, they say I'm homophobic, transphobic. Yeah. I hate, I hate black women. Uh, but then they say I pander to black women. Well, it's also I'm a, it, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Uncle Tom and a sellout. How can I be a Uncle Tom, a sellout, and racist? Like, like yeah. I, I'm getting, yeah. I'm, I'm getting labeled everything. I, I'm gay and homophobic. Yeah, I'm transitioning and I'm transphobic. Like, I'm yeah. getting all of this shit at once. You yeah. know what I mean? So it was just like. Yo, I can't listen to none of this. It'll drive you. It'll drive me fucking insane. Well, that's the other thing is, as much as we all go like, ah, oh, I don't pay attention to the comments. It's like, you're looking at a human being saying something about you, even if you're the hardest motherfucker in the world. It that's gets right. in six, five, seven percent. That's right. So, and if you're like sensitive, it gets in forty. I heard so, fucking Trick Trick, the rapper one time, Trick Trick said, "Man." As soon as I turn my phone off, I don't give a fuck about what none of y'all motherfuckers talking about, right? Yeah. And I was like, oh shit, he's right. You yeah. know, because I'm like, why are we in verbally abusive relationships with our smartphones? You're absolutely right. And it's, yeah, it's like, I'll notice like, like if I, I take Instagram off my phone and then I'm like, I feel pretty good. Well, Instagram I can do for one reason. You can filter shit. Yeah, no, that's great. So you I can like literally that, right? just yeah. anything you don't want to see. Like, you, yeah. That's right, the words, and you don't have to see it. Twitter, you don't have no choice. So for I me, blocked every word on on Instagram except except for uh, hilarious <laughs> and gorgeous <laughs> and icon. I blocked any any word I don't want to see. Yep. Anything anything I know is gonna fuck up my mental health. I block Twitter. I don't have that luxury, so I just choose not to be over there. Yeah, you know, and I haven't deleted it yet because it's just like I don't know. I feel like you know one day they're gonna pay people for those 2 million followers maybe I don't know yeah, yeah I stopped I, I think I got, when I got like 2.5 million followers I stopped Instagram yeah. kept growing it, Twitter I don't even I don't even go over there well and I don't think that you're a bitch for blocking work like I block why wouldn't I block yeah because that's what basically boundaries are and we all have boundaries it's like Chris's Chris Rock's joke about like you only go so far in an argument and like women will say shit and then kind of wince when they go too far like your mom is a bitch and like that <laughs> um but there's like we yeah it's like if you wouldn't say that if i was near you absolutely so absolutely. i'm gonna block you from saying things that you wouldn't say absolutely i'm doing you a favor absolutely sir. So but yeah it's still hard i i'm trying to think of like in the last 24 hours i looked at something and that like seeped in and, and people go literally on Twitter just to ruin your day. I would tweet out every morning, thank you, God, for blessing me with another day of life. And like clockwork, there would be somebody saying, ah, I was praying you died. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know I, mean? I I one time tweeted uh it, it was I was up early and I tweeted uh thank thank you God for blessing Charlemagne with another <laughs> day of life. And also, people, this people, reminds me of another thing. I I I've done ayahuasca a bunch of times to talk about it endlessly, but last time I did it, there were some moments that were like difficult, like just like woozy and kind of connected to God and whatever. And I kept doing your line and we thank God for it all. <laughs> but I was God getting my God. ass whooped. In the ayahuasca experience? Yeah. I credit you with that too. I'm, do, I'm doing it this year. Like I, I, everybody tells me don't do it till it calls you. I feel like it's been calling me the last couple of years. And I always say Neil Brennan said he saw God. Neil Brennan didn't even believe in God. He was an atheist until he did ayahuasca. I want to Roy was on here last night. Roy did it through my people and uh and the shit and he it's a two night thing. Roy only did one night because he got so much from the first night that he wow. was like peace. And he told me the shit he got from it and it's like I could cry telling you what he got from it. Did they tell him he was getting a daily show? You know what? They said he's they're giving him one week. That's what ayahuasca told. <laughs> um in it's gonna be in April. It's gonna be one week. They he ayahuasca said Leslie's gonna do it and be great. Yeah, yeah. And Wanda and um <laughs> so I got you on ayahuasca. But it was I meant to tell you that that it was I was like literally going and we thank God for it all. And I'm getting like pummeled. <laughs> and I had a shaman send me a book earlier this year. That's how I know I'm supposed to do it this year. A shaman sent me a book through Andrew Schultz. And he signed it and everything. And he was like, yo, I've been watching your healing journey. And I'm, I'm, I, we, we, we've been talking. So I'm, I'm setting up Great, the experience. Man. It might be the same person you use. I don't know. I'm going to tell you afterwards. We'll, we'll tell you off the air. Yeah. Wink, wink. All right. One of your blocks is crowds. Yeah. I don't like crowds. I've never, I've never, I've never liked large crowds. This is one of the School. reasons. School. Cafeteria, schools, cafeteria. One of the reasons I don't, I never like going to concerts. You know, I love comedy shows. You know what I mean? But I, I like, I, and I love going to them. But you know, I, I just don't like being in those big crowds. You know, and 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 especially nowadays. You know, because you don't know why people are looking at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like like you like how Jay Z said, "Friend of foe, yo, state your biz." You don't know if somebody's like, "Oh, that's Charlamagne. I fuck with him." You know what I mean? Are they just like? Oh, I'm gonna get that motherfucker. Cause some yeah. people will speak and be like, oh, what up? I mean, you know what I mean? And some people will be like, and even the people that speak, you don't, you I don't know why you approaching me. That might just be to, 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 to get me distracted. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, I don't like that's another crowds. downside of social media, I think. Meaning you don't know how people know you. Yeah. And you don't know if they're like, oh, if you got into a feud with somebody. Absolutely. And you're like, oh, are you on his side? That's like right. you don't know how people know you, what they think of you, what they if they it or or if there's automatic resentment because you have status more than them right. and all that shit and it is makes people paranoid that's right in a way that but you already had that you like that's already right. didn't like is it like trampling is it like a fear of, of like a stampede because we live in a world where the only thing that's keeping us safe is um one one of us not going so called crazy <laughs> you know what i mean right. so yeah. our whole existence is avoiding crazy you know what i mean you don't want to be around anything that's unstable or might snap so you, you can be in controlled environments like okay i know neil you know what i mean i'm in a room yeah. with people that i know i've been around before i've been in this room before yeah, so yeah. It's, you know, it's, odds are no one's gonna swing absolutely you know yeah. but when you're places that you don't know all of these people man that's a lot of energies you're just hoping don't bug out <laughs> you know? yeah you know so for that reason i really don't i don't i can't do crowds what did you do with this at your book signings um, sit behind the desk, but that's that's even that is controlled, right? Because right, it's a lot of security. You know, if the crazy comes, I don't have to deal with it. You know what I mean? So it's like you sitting there, you sign your books, you say hi to people. The book signers were interesting. That's funny you asked me that because, like I said, I, I never was, I wasn't, I wasn't out. Like there was a time when we were in all the clubs. Breakfast Club would go around the country and host parties, stuff like that. Like I said, I was drunk high to be able to go out and do that. But I remember telling Angela and then be like, yo, whatever we want to be doing five years from now, we got to start doing now. I don't want to be in the clubs five years from now. So I stopped. I stopped going to the clubs, stopped doing our annual day party, all of that type of stuff. And when I put the book out, I would have like speaking engagements, right? Um, but when we had the book signings, I hadn't been out. I hadn't been right, out in a few yeah. years. So when this book comes out. COVID came early for you. <laughs> yes. Basically. So, yeah. So when this book comes out, Man, 
I'm going to these book signings and 800, 900 people are showing up to the bookstores. And I'm like, for me? Right? You know what yeah. I mean? And then that's where a lot of the imposter syndrome started to come into place. Because number one, I'm happy to see these people. And I'm like, man, I can't believe these people care about me enough to, to buy my book. But also, I don't deserve none of this shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's a double whammy. It's the crowd and the, I don't deserve any of this shit. You know what I mean? But luckily, I was able to just take in that moment. Because in my mind, also, your mind, you know this is never going to happen again. Even though it did happen again for my second book. But I was like, for the first book, I'm like, this is never going to happen again. So you better enjoy it. Enjoy the fucking moment. And the funny thing is that what do, what do most people say in line? They love me. That's they, they just hear. like, thank you? Yeah, they, yeah. yeah. I thank you. You know, I appreciate it, man. You know, especially when the, after after the book was out for like a month. Yeah. You know, because it, people it read it. on the New York Times bestsellers. Oh, when they read it, it was like, oh. I had people in line saying, Yo, I used to hate you until I yeah. read your book, you know? Like, so I was like, oh, shit. You know what I mean? Or, yeah. or even, even those moments, right? Like, in my mind, I'm this despicable human that does all of this wild, perverted shit on the air. But no, actually... You've been balanced. You give people, there's, 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 there's people coming up to you talking to me about interviews that I didn't even think yeah. that they watched. Like, you know what I mean? Like, man, I loved when you had, you know, Dick Gregory on. I love when you had, you know, an honorable minister Louis Farrakhan on. I love when you, like that, it was that as well. And yeah. it was those, you know, those moments where I would, I would, I always would talk about my life and talk about things that I learned. That's why I was able to, my first book, I was able to write these lessons that I learned in my life. Those eight lessons that I put in my book, that's what I had been living off for a while. So I was always giving those lessons out. I just never had documented them in a book. So people, they gravitated towards that too. So the thing that I even thought people liked me for, they didn't give a fuck about that shit. Well, that's what I was saying. It's like, <laughs> that's not what people like about no. They don't, they don't. No. So I got them caught in my own head. Like I said, reading comments. Yeah. But that also shows you that the internet is the bottom of the barrel, right? Like, do you really want to cater to Think these Think about a person who would make a comment on the internet. Like I, I don't think I know anyone that would make it. Like that's right. That it's just people that are have bad lives and that's they right. just take a shot at somebody with, that looks like they have a that's good right. life. And it really hasn't changed at all. At all, it's gotten worse. Yeah. So you really cater. You really want to cater to these idiots? Yeah. You know. And I see so many people doing that now. That's why I'm able to recognize it. Like I got a lot of friends, whether they political pundits, yeah. whether they comedian. I'm like, bro, don't play to that crowd. Yeah. Bro. You don't want that. I, I can talk to somebody and be like, that's not, that's Twitter talking, bro. Yeah. That ain't even you. You know, I yeah. hate that shit. Yeah. What was the shift in the, in the imposter syndrome? Cause I can oh. say for myself, okay. it was, I just did enough sh things on my own without Dave, for lack of a better explanation, that people really respected and people that I respected, respected. And I could tell that there was like a, the way people's energy was around me was different than it was a year prior. Mm -hmm. And it I'm sorry to say it felt good. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. It's like it's it's like we shouldn't pay attention to what the outside world said, whatever, whatever. But your peers or your I think you can pay attention and notice the level of respect. I think the shift for me was remembering something that my father always told me is that you're never as good as they say you are and you're never as bad as they say you are. And also uh, a great mentor of mine, my man Com uh, Cadillac Jack, Cadillac Jack would say, uh, remember the rule of 10, three people gonna like it, three people not gonna like it, four people don't even give a fuck. They just sitting yeah. around waiting to see what the, 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 the popular opinion is, you know? And then I remember having a conversation, I'm gonna name drop two people, so pick them up. Uh, Tyler Perry, I remember yeah. watching Tyler Perry talk about worthiness and how, you know, he, he dealt with um, uh, not feeling worthy for a while and, you know, I don't remember what his moment was that started making him feel worthy, but he just was saying, when you get to that place, you're going to know. And I remember having a, I had a conversation with Bishop T.D. Jakes. It's, it's actually documented because we did it for his podcast. It's on YouTube. And I was talking to him about it. And this was something, it was interesting at the time because this was something I was unpacking in therapy about being molested when I was eight, you know, um, by, by my, my, a woman. And I was getting molested at eight. And then Bishop T.D. Jakes, I, t I was talking to him about that and unpacking my unfeelings of unworthiness. So it was like, I was having a conversation with him in that moment, but I was also having that same conversation in therapy. And I remember him saying to me, people who have been molested at that young age usually struggle with feelings of un unworthiness. You know what I mean? They never quite feel secure. And then when I thought about it, right, I'm like, damn, this woman not only used to 
you know, molest me. I didn't look at it as molestation back then. I still thought she let me suck yeah, the titties. Yeah, 90s. And, <laughs> yeah, you let me suck yeah. the titties. You, you know, <laughs> giving me head at nine. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, you heard that? Exactly, right? I didn't look at it like that. So when I stopped letting her, cause you know, it's, it's a natural thing inside of you that eventually, even though it feels good, you like, this shit ain't right. Something yeah. ain't right. Why yeah. you don't want me to tell nobody what you're I don't doing understand to me. time or numbers because I'm nine. <laughs> but this is not, I know that this isn't right. Word. So I remember one time I had, you remember those little firecrackers you throw and they yeah. pop? So I had some and she tried to come at me. Every time an adult would leave the room, she would try to come at me. I pop, pop, throw the firecrackers at her. And when I stopped letting her do that, like, yo, she would, she started calling me ugly and telling me I had a big nose and, that shit stuck with me, yeah. right? So me having a, oh, you ugly, you got a big nose. I felt that way for a long time. Then you get, grow older and you get in like middle school and kids are calling you bunky nose, right? That, that, that was, that's what they call me in middle school, bunky pretty good, nose. Pretty good. Great, great, pretty, right? Pretty good slam. But I'm, I didn't realize I'm connecting traumas. You know what yeah. I mean? Because me getting called bunky nose triggered me from when I was eight years old and this woman was telling me that I had a big nose. So I thought... Throughout my whole life, I had to please people. I had to give people what they wanted from me, even if it didn't make me happy. Because if I didn't make them happy, they would make me feel bad. Yeah. Right? So I, that, I unpacked all that in therapy. And when Bishop T.D. Jakes was talking to me about worthiness, and he, he said that to me, and I'm just like, oh, shit, I started to connect all these dots yeah. as to why I feel the way I feel. And I just remember December 2019, it was the holidays. And I'm I'm sitting in my room, my, my at, at my old crib, and I just remember literally sitting there looking out the window saying, "Yo, I'm worthy, yo. I'm worthy." You know, you look at you look at you look at down at your living room and you see the Christmas tree and everything. And I think at the time I only had two daughters at the time because I think it was like 2018, 2019. I had three daughters at the time. So you're looking down and you're like, "Damn, I'm worthy." Like I literally was just I just said it to myself, "I am worthy," you know. I am a good person. I've done good for myself, you know, and like from that and moment on. And it stuck. On, What's it funny stuck. is when it finally like, yeah. you can almost physically feel the shift. Yeah, and that's exactly what it felt like. It's like, yo, you are not all of these different, you know, yeah. moments that have happened to you. You know what I mean? Like they, they you, are, you are those things, but you know, you're, you're not just those things. So don't let those things own you. And when it's so like when you're not a, a bunky, what is bunky nose? Bunky nose. <laughs> What's and great about kids is I don't even never heard the word bunky. And it was and a it, jingle. And it gets it, it gets its point across. <laughs> <laughs> one of my one of my homegirls had a jingle for it. Bunky nose. Great. Whenever I would walk in. <laughs> even even better. One of your blocks is small talk. Small talk. Didn't see that coming, seeing as that's kind of your one of your jobs. Well, no, I feel like when I'm doing interviews, it's a real conversation. Yeah, I, you know what? I totally agree with you. Yeah. By the way, like I don't like it's the it's the introversion thing. It's like the like, hey, I, when you finally go like, I mean, recently it's been like a hot. It's almost like a, a, a astrological sign. Like I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, or whatever. But once you realize it, it's not. It's that's by the way what people like about you mm -hmm. is that you don't i don't do small talk either i hate it i can't do it i'd rather be quiet totally and, and, agree. and that's how i am i, I if, I'm, if we're together like i'm probably i'm probably quiet i'm probably zoned out thinking about something i might be on my phone but i'm not like i'm not there i don't want to just make conversation for the sake of making conversation just because we're in the same space that's why i love people who understand that yeah you know what I mean? yeah i love people who understand we ain't here to make no 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 small talk. You know what I mean? That's why my circle is the way that it is. Like when my friends are talking, we're talking. When we're not, we ain't tripping that we're not. I get people want to connect, but to a lot of us, it feels like the opposite of connection. It feels like an insult to actual connection. Yes. Like, you know, we can really connect. Yeah. If you want to, and then people do the thing like, well, this is getting deep. And you're like, I don't care about where you, what your favorite team. I don't care. I could give a fuck less. Yeah. And, and the crazy part is when you do it for a living like we do, that's the last thing you want to do is just have small talk. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we have conversations for a living. We're always constantly talking. So if we're not actually talking about something, yeah. let's, can we cut the chit chat, please? Yeah. And you can do it in a way that you can talk in a way that people appreciate and it isn't bullshit it's just not bullshit oh, man and, and it's what you were saying about the uh, people trying to make 
deep connections. The worst thing in the world is when you're like at a club or you're out somewhere and somebody takes that time to try to tell you something deep. Yeah, and you're like, wow, <laughs> wow, wow. You can only hit him with a wow. Wow, wow. Yeah, wow. like, why are you doing this right now? Yes. You know, I can't really hear you. There's, yes. I love deep yes. conversations. Yeah. But not here, not sir. Not here, bro. This ain't the time. Like, yeah. no, no, no. Yo, yo, can I speak? You, yo, <laughs> I was molested too. You're like, we're at Summer Jam. Maybe not now, sir. I, <laughs> and you know what? I, you can't feel bad about telling people no, right? Like, I, I, I did that to Prince. Tried to make small talk. Because <laughs> it was Prince. Prince was at the radio station. This was years ago. This was like... This is literally like when Breakfast Club first started. It's like 12 years ago. We've been on, this is, we're in our 13th year. So this had to be like 12, 11 years ago. And we're in the studio and somebody goes, yo, Prince is in the building. And like, Prince is in the building. Mind you, it's 6.30 in the fucking mm -hmm. morning. Nobody's there except for the morning show. I'm like, why? We didn't hear nothing about Prince being on the air today. So put the studio on auto, go in the hall. Soon as we open, you've been to the old Breakfast yeah. Club studio. Soon as we come out the door, Prince is walking by. Like, oh shit, Prince. Nicest guy in the world. He comes over. He shakes our hand. I go, I grew up Jehovah Witness too. <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, oh, we're going to have to talk about that one day. And I'm when, when the fuck would we ever talk about that again? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? And yeah. then I go, can we get a picture? And he's like, no, I don't, I'm not in the mood to take a picture right now. It's early in the morning. I respect it. No small talk. Yeah. And no small talk. Handshakes. Hey, respect it. Don't want to take pictures. Hey, we got to talk about that one day. Out. Yeah. That's it. Great. I don't know why I feel the need some time to stand there and talk to the person. You just choke. <laughs> just, ch just a good old-fashioned yeah. choke. Yeah. You just choked on it. Yeah. Um, sativa, we kind of covered. Yeah. For the, all, the, all the reasons we talked about. Yeah. Because the worst thing you could do is take sativa when you're in a crowd. And not, <laughs> is are we talking any weed or we're talking- No, I love indica. That- Okay, so you are yeah, one of the yeah, people yeah. who understand strains because yeah. it like all just makes me fold in on myself. My favorite thing now is this hybrid. I do this hybrid. It's called uh, what's the brand name? It's called Wana, or it's not Wawa. Wawa is the convenience store. It's like Wana, I think it is uh -huh. W A N A, and it's a uh, it's a hybrid. It's a watermelon hybrid. I don't even know what it's a hybrid of. I'm assuming it's sativa and indigo, or maybe it's indigo and CBD. But it's a watermelon hybrid, and I do 10 milligrams of that, and it makes me feel how I think weed makes everybody else feel. Right. <laughs> you know how when you saw people yeah. smoking weed all like, these oh, years and you're like, yeah. oh shit. When I do that, I'm like, okay, now I get why y'all do this. Relaxed, not Absolutely. anxious, Absolutely. cool. And that same humane. brand has another one that's a grape one that's just a straight indigo. And if I do five, 10 milligrams of that, same thing. Like that, when I do those, I realize why people uh, partake in THC. Great. Okay, this is a good one. Over committing yeah. and not saying no. Yeah. I assume that this, you being here is that, I'm kidding. Um, you overcommitted, you wanted to say no and you were like, I can't. No, I, I didn't want to say no, but then I had two other things at 11 o'clock that I didn't, like you saw me on yeah, the yeah, Zoom yeah. earlier and I was like, oh shit. But that was because I didn't even have to be on that. I saw that that was happening. Yes. And I told my people like, yo, I'm gonna jump on at 11, right? But my assistant's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, 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 at, you got Neil at 11, but then you got this other thing at 11. You got another thing at 11. And she's like, stop doing that. That is why I'm here. Like, direct them to me. And, that's yeah. what, and, and so that, I have to, you know, commit to that. Like, okay, you know what? Yeah. And because it sounds crazy, right? Talk to my assistant. I know. But you realize why people do that. That's yeah. not some boot. It, it reminds me when I first moved to New York and realized why people wear fur coats. All before I thought everybody was just like, oh, he's just wearing a fucking fur coat to show yeah. up. We're like, no, you actually might need a fur coat in New yeah, York yeah. City. You know what I mean? It's the same thing. You, you don't. Just FYI. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> They're still just doing it to wear you a fur coat. You might have used to. Climate change might have changed that. Back in the day, you might have <laughs> Man, back in my day, you had to wear a fucking animal fur. In the 90s, it was, that's how cold it was. I, don't, I still don't have a fur, by the way. So, all right. So, how do you, why do you think you ever commit? People pleasing. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes back to you don't want to be called boogie nose. That's it. Say it. Yeah. People yeah. pleasing, Try, making people happy. Don't want people to be like, oh man, you know, I tried to do such and such with him, and he said, gave me his sister's number. Or yeah, he, he blew me off. Or he told me he would do it, and he didn't do it. Yada yada yada. You know what I mean? Like all of that. Like yeah. it's literally, literally, 
People pleasing. Like, that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. It goes back to that little eight-year-old boy who was getting molested, who made the woman stop. And when he made that woman stop, that woman put every insecurity into him, telling him he's ugly, he got a big nose, you know, nobody's going to ever like him, yada, 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 that shit. Okay. Well, how do you deal with the idea of someone else's judgment? Because that's the t that's not easy. Still not easy. Right. So how do you how do you compartmentalize it or how do you see it? Is it just like that's just part? I saw Ooh. somebody said Jordan Peterson said that if in order to be a leader, you have to be comfortable with not being liked. And that I I don't even know if I agree with it, but I think I I I agree with it in some way. I think I got to weigh my in, intention over the impact. Because at the end of the day, we say our first, last, and best love is self-love, right? So, you know, if, if 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 you're not happy, if you're not satisfied, if your cup isn't full, how are you going to pour into other people? So I, I, I consider myself a public servant. Like, I really do feel like I'm here to be of service to others. But service to others doesn't mean, you know... Disservice to yourself. Disservice to yourself. Making them feel good at your expense. So if it's not going to make me feel good, then I just got to simply say no. And if that person doesn't understand that or respect that, you know, then you probably shouldn't have been doing nothing for that person to begin with. And I don't owe anybody no excuses. Like, I don't have to call and be like, hey, man, I'm not coming because I'm having a panic attack. You know what I'm saying? Hey, hey man, I'm sorry, man. I overcommitted, man. I, I should have directed you to my assistant, but I didn't. Now I got this other thing to do that honestly is more important. You know, I get I get what you got going on, you know what I mean? But honestly, what I got going on is more important. Um, I, I'm happy to be here because I like having, con I yeah. genuinely have, like having conversations with you. Yeah. Like, I do. I, I'm, yeah. I've always enjoyed listening to you and I enjoy having conversations. So I'm yeah. like, oh, shit, Neil called me to come do the podcast. Yeah, I'm going to go do it. I'm, I'm, I'm actually free. I mean, only yeah. thing I got is some Zooms, you right. know what I mean? But like, I'm saying, how do you deal with if someone you didn't want to talk? Like, do you deal... Is it is it one of these things of like I'm so busy that I can't do everything and that's fine and I pre forgive you. I'm fine. I, I guess you got to let them argue over you being an asshole because everybody's experience is different, right? So if there is something, meaning you just accept like I, yes, I accept you, I'm going to have to live right. with the fact that you may think I'm an asshole. I might be a villain in that person's story. I might yeah. be an asshole in that person's story. You know, hopefully there's enough people having enough conversations about me that if you talk to ten different people you'll probably get 10 different things, but at least there might be one consistent thing. And that one consistent thing, I hope, is that, oh, he does, show, he shows up for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's like, cause you're not gonna win them all. Cause some shit I just don't want to do. And people get offended when you yeah. like, I don't want to do that. Like, why, why? Cause I don't want to. Yeah, like I can't, like, you know how you like one flavor of ice yeah, cream, man. but not another? That's it. Right. Some shit just ain't for me. And well, is, do you get offended by shit? No. You don't get offended by somebody not wanting to not at all fuck with you or somebody not at all I, and i guess because because it's kind of the same thing you're dealing with somebody else's judgment yeah of and, you and i know how i know how that feels you know so no i don't and also when it comes to rejection man i think if you've been in this business long enough Oof. you know how to deal with rejection you know what i'm saying fury oh, just fury. get furious about it and really <laughs> take it personally you know, and that's my plan you know what helps you with rejection when something gets turned down and it may not have been for that person, but then somebody else loves it and yeah, picks it up, and it, it you know it, like it just wasn't for that person. Like, they, I, and I never take that personal. You go pitch something, and somebody's yeah. like, oh, I'm not feeling that. You know yeah. what I mean? But like, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do about it. It just wasn't for that individual. I'm trying to force it down that person's throat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, no, I'm gonna go over here. Yeah, and this person is gonna put put it in their mouth willingly. <laughs> One time I was pitching a movie with a buddy of mine and. A guy named Mike Sher, who's gone on to do created Parks and Rec and Good Place and like wow. a killer. Wow. We were pitching a movie. I mean, here's two. St I don't want to tell that story, but one of the stories is in the middle of a pitch, we're just bombing, just getting nothing. And I look over at Sher and he's talking, and it was like the sound went down, and I just saw like one bead of sweat coming down his fucking cheek. And I looked at the guy and I go, We'll come back with another one. Wow. Like, but well, don't worry about this. Like, we'll just come back with another. Like, we're just you don't like this one. Yeah, there's yeah, nothing we can yeah, do. Yeah. Like, yeah. fine. And, just, and, and tell yeah. me that. Just tell me. Yeah, it's like you just don't like it, and I get it. Cool. Yeah. Goodbye. Like, I like some movies more than others. Absolutely. And some of the movies I don't like are extremely popular. Absolutely. So, you know, I get it. Like, we're allowed to have taste. It is hard. That's the beauty of age is that you really 
learn how to not take shit personally. Whoa. But man, it took me 30 years to figure that out. I read the four agreements, who who knows how long ago, De a decade or better, right? Probably longer. And that four agreement of uh, uh, don't take things personally, what people do is not because of you. You that shit. You don't realize that till you get wild older. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? It's hard because like, like me don't take things personally. What what other people do is because of them and not me. What? Huh? You know? Well, they they say don't take the bad stuff personally, but take the good stuff personally. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I can't. This is very inconsistent. Yeah. Because you want the good stuff to seep into my self esteem, but the bad stuff some mix up. Yeah. And it's like, eh. But that's I, my dad. You're never as good as they say you are. You're never as bad as they say you are. It's just all. It's just all noise at the end of the day. Yeah. You just gotta be here with it. Like all everything that you're looking for has to come from inside. And I like, know it's the but the world really competes with the messaging on that. The me, the world is constantly going like it's over here. Yeah. It's in this drink. Yeah. It's in this. It's it's this shirt. Yeah. It's this achievement. It's this, and you truly have to like make a concerted effort. Like no, that it can never be that. That's right. It right. cannot be that I'll That's participate right. and I'll try to win when right. I do it, but like it can't be that. It might be some of those things, but do those things because you genuinely want to do those things. Yeah. I like drinking. Drinking now is better for me because I'm not overindulging. Like I'm not drinking a whole bottle of motherfucking, you know, Remy Martin, you know, just yeah. because I'm really trying to suppress all of this anxiety. Like I'm not doing that. But when I'm out, I, I truly understand what they, why they call it spirits. You know uh -huh. what I mean? I can have two, you know, double shots of tequila and be good all night long because I'm drinking because I actually want to. Yeah. I'm not drinking to suppress anything. I'm drinking because I'm feeling festive because I'm out yeah. with my people. Where and you like people. And yeah, like, yeah. yeah. You love crowds all of a sudden. No. Yeah. I love my I love my crowd. Like, <laughs> I, yeah. love, I love that circle I choose to be with in that moment. Well, and I'm, I know that I'm contradicting myself because I said that, like, my self-esteem change when i got more respect from other people but it's i wish i didn't i wish i'd just gotten it from some core soul wisdom but unfortunately we don't live in a it, it it's a fucked up exist it's a my, crazy existence mine was core soul wisdom when i realized i really am who i say i am meaning that when i started to actually you know do the work on myself. And like the hardest thing to cut out was like other women, right? When I, you know, and I call it sobriety. This is what I mean, that's why me and your dad never did it. We never cut out other women. <laughs> and that's why, that's why I call it sobriety. Cause it's like, yo, I haven't even thought about being with another woman since 2016, you know what I mean? Like yeah. October 2016. And I'm like, yo, this is one of the things that I have to cut out in order to be the man that I truly want to be, not just for myself, but for my wife, for my daughters. You know what I mean? So it's like 2016 to now. And I don't have the desire in any way, shape, or form. I am so happy. You know, I am so happy in my wife with, with my wife. I'm so happy in my marriage. Like, you know, I'm, I'm able to pour into her in a different way. We're pouring into each other in a different way. And when you cut, when I cut that out, I'm like, okay, I'm not full of shit. Because you feel full of Real shit. quick, do you think cheating is more ego based or passive aggressive? It's all ego. Okay. It's all it's a hundred percent ego. You know what I mean? Because as 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 a man, especially in this business, like that's almost like it it's supposed to come with it, right? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yes. like, it's supposed yes. to come with it. And if you're not doing it, you feel like something's wrong. Goes back to my pops. My yeah. pops looking at me saying, Oh, you only got one girlfriend in this business? Oh, you ain't got no holes. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, oh, and then, you holeless? Like, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So it's like, you think you're supposed to have a bunch of different women. You know what I mean? Like, you're out at the club. You know, you hosting a party. It's supposed to be a flock yeah. of women coming yeah. in here. And when I realized I cut that out and that was no longer a part of my life, that was like a real commitment, right? And I know, I know people say, oh, you're not supposed to get props for doing the right thing. You're absolutely correct. But I'm just talking about internally for me, it it's let, hard, it, it, it dude. It let me know it's, I am who I say I am. It's hard. It's also hard to really distill what your actual values are versus what 
external value. What Ooh. what values you've been told yeah. are valuable. Hell yeah. It's fucking yeah. really, really hard. And it's probably endless, by the way. Like I think so. Like it even in old age, it will always be a challenge. Not like we're not an old, but I'm saying like old, old. Like, ah, uh, do I really like this sort of corrective shoe? <laughs> Yeah, or am yeah, I yeah. just like it because all the people around me are like, are, like whatever the whatever the status symbols are of that thing, it'll be. It's very hard to not just bite. I realized that with like things, right? Like you know, when you broke, you see a Bentley and be like, I don't want that shit. Why the fuck would you spend that much money on yeah, a car? Yada yeah. yada yada. But when you really get the money and can afford it, and you feel that same way. You are who you say you are. Yeah. You know, you about what you say you about. You believe what you really believe. You go, why don't you? And you're like, I don't like it. I don't like it. That yeah. ain't me. Yeah. Like, it's just that simple. That's not me. Like, and I don't need that to feel better about myself. You know what I mean? I'm not, yeah. And I'm not saying that's why people buy those things. I'm just saying, for me, I don't Some need Some people just have horrible taste and values. Yeah. I agree. God bless. <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. But I would argue that it's probably, it's like put on them. Um, all right. Final question. And I forget to ask it sometimes. Charlemagne movie, Charlemagne biopic. Who plays you? By the way, there's a. I've never thought you look like Morris Chestnut. And come on, give it up, Neil. About come on. a dozen times today, I've thought, is this Morris Chestnut? Yeah, well, that I'm speaking to. to? That's I, great. I know I texted Charlemagne. He might have sent Morris Chestnut. You've always been a man with a great eye. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, what's the movie about what's the character arc oh and who plays you i think uh the movie would be about um man that's a great question the movie would be definitely about a, a journey of healing you know it would definitely be about a journey of healing i think it would have to be like a a, a coming of age tale you know i think um the younger version of me i learned so much from every day so I'm still exploring that. So if I did do a movie or a TV show, I would want to do it through that lens. Through like through the 13? Before that, probably uh, probably from the time I can remember first grade to about when I started getting in trouble in high school. You know what I mean? Like when I started like running in the streets doing shit I ain't had no business doing. Because I learned so much about m myself now because of that person. You know what I mean? And like my 20s, 20s, and like to like 35 was me not dealing with the things I had, not dealing with the traumas I had experienced in my childhood. And all of those things were showing up in my uh, young adulthood, but I wasn't acknowledging them. I wasn't connecting the dots. I was, I was acting like, you know, my life was different movies. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not different movies. It's the same movie. Well, it movie. sounds like you became, you were like formed between eight and 13 and then betrayed that betrayed yeah. all the things you learned until you were 35 and then yeah. 35 on was like oh that shit was yeah valuable yeah and and and, and man and i'm thinking about it now and i, I thought the, the the people pleasing has showed up in so many different aspects of my life you said something that made me think about that like when i was a kid i didn't have to do none of the shit that i was doing my mom was an english teacher you know she's a jehovah witness i had a beautiful grandmother who was a baptist my dad oh was, by the way how they let how did you get away with it as a jehovah's witness but that's my point i yeah. I, I didn't have any reason to do any of the stuff that i was yeah. doing i was acting out because i was trying to please people when i first started getting in trouble in school was because sixth grade i'm in the advanced classes i'm wearing glasses i got a fanny pack you know what i'm saying it's only like me and like two other black kids in this class because in all the advanced classes it was all the white kids yep. so naturally i'm hanging around all the white kids but then like my cousins who were like the, the 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 goons, right? The thugs. They hated me being around all these white kids, so they used to bully me. Mm -hmm. So they used to bully the fuck out of me, beat me up, slam me. So it got to a point where the white kids were like, "Man, I'm not. I don't want to be around you because these guys are always coming to beat you up." And my glasses used to always fall off and break. So at one day, I was just like, "Man, fuck that shit. If you can't beat them, join them." So started hanging with them. That's when all my troubles in school started. People pleasing. You know what I mean? So it's just like my whole life. There's been all of these moments of people pleasing, you know what I mean? So I would explore and, and, a lot of that. And coming into yourself. Absolutely. Or coming back to yourself, like who you truly are when no one's around. There you go. That's exactly what it's, it is. That's, that's one right. of the great challenges Ooh. of life anyway, is like, who, all right, no one's around. Who am I? That's right. And then I'm like, okay, you look in the mirror, like when you get out there, be this. And then yeah. you go out there and be something totally different. And you might can be all those things, right? right? Because I, I I can be around those guys and you grow to love like hardcore hip hop. Right. I love 
you know, back then in middle school, I loved the, you know, I still love it now, but you know, you love the Wu Tangs and the Onyxes yeah. and all that shit like that. But guess what? I also like reading Judy Bloom. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? I love Judy Bloom. Yeah. You know? So it's just like you go back and forth. Yeah, I love Boys in the Hood, but I love my girl too with Macaulay right. Culkin. But you know yes, what I mean? But, like, that, but <laughs> yes, I, I would argue that your values are in Judy Bloom and my girl and yeah. you're like sort of cultural. I mean, I, the, my feeling about hip hop has always been like, I, I, disagree with everything they're saying but i love the way they say it yeah like man this is bullshit but say it again and also we the, the thing is we gotta we kind of gotta go out of our way to do this shit you know what i mean like the, the, shit, the, the goon shit yeah like the yes. shit the hip-hop artists talk about like, like bro we're in monk's corner south carolina like we yeah we don't really have to do a lot of this shit that we're doing it was we named there was different hoods in our in our in, in the community we named after like uh, it was Queensbridge and oh, that's uh, so uh, funny. Shallon and <laughs> like And everybody like, abided by it? Not Everyone. everybody, but a few places, you know what I mean? But and even even like people would take on the name of groups like the Hit Squad. Like that. None of this is us, guys. <laughs> that's so funny. You know what I'm saying? So it's like none so of this is like us. So it's like culturally everyone's abandoning themselves to be this we, other thing. Yeah, we never really we we did we, like, we did probably later on in life, but at that time, we weren't tapping into who we were. Yeah. You know what I mean? We weren't tapping into who we were. We were tapping into what we were taking in as far as the culture, the music, and the movies, and everything else is concerned. What's the final scene in the movie? Because, by the way, if it's a period, like what would, if it is the like the young period, you and the flashback, the flashback I don't, uh, I don't the structure. Scene, yeah, I don't know if the final scene in the movie has happened yet. Because it would be that it would be me flashing back through adulthood. Yeah. To to to, to my my inner child. You know what I mean? So I don't. I don't know if the final scene in the movie is has happened yet. If that makes sense. I think it's the TD Jakes part. I think it's the TD Jakes. It's Feeling December worthy. 2019, right before COVID. Yeah, that yeah, that could be it. When no. you're like, oh, I don't have to be this other bullshit. No, I that can could just be, it. be me. No, that could be it. Fade to black. I never thought about it, but yeah, that could be it. Because yeah, I would do. I wouldn't. It's not like a, it'd be a continuous TV show. It'd be on some Everybody Hates Christian. Yeah, right? it'd be like. Four seasons, five or seasons. Or if top, I'm, what I'm saying, I'm I'm thinking more two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a private parts. Yeah. And it done, I just say that as because you brought it up. Yeah. Um, and the most helpful things you've done in terms of mental health therapy, therapy. period. Therapy, period. Because therapy opened the door for everything else. You know what I mean? My homegirl Debbie Brown. I give Dev props. I give Dev props just like I give you props all the time. Dev uh, told me like, look, therapy is great. You know, therapy gives you. The language helps you to understand what you're going through, but at some point you're gonna have to do some real healing. Yeah. At some point you're gonna have to actually deal with that trauma. Like you know what I mean? Like you're gonna have to actually go out there and do some things to deal with that trauma. So all, all, everything that comes with that, whether it's the brain training, whether it's the float therapy, whether it's the you know plant based journey, whatever it is to help get that trauma out, the deep tissue massages, the yeah. meditation, all of that started with me going to therapy. So therapy is absolutely the gateway drug to healing. So that's been the most important thing. Therapy was my cocaine that led me to crack. I don't know why you had to bring crack into it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Charlemagne the God. He yes, helped indeed. himself. I helped myself. Hey. We can all help ourselves. Peace.